Okay, is that is that screen shared now? Let me see. Yes, I can. I okay. see. Uh, I see the. Uh, yeah, maybe you want to make it uh, full screen if you like. Um, uh, excellent. I mean, people can still see it, but if you make it uh, a presentation or a full screen, this would yeah. be. Uh, yeah. I'm looking for the permission to do that right now. I got it. Got it. Okay. All right. Let me uh, unmute some people that might help us in discussion as well. Um, uh -huh. I'll have um, Beverly and um, Patty. I'm, I'll unmute them right now or become a co host. Hi, Patty. Hi, Zach. How are you? Good. Patty, can I ask you uh, for a favor? So if somebody will, will jump, will send a question through a chat or want to ask a question and they raise their hand, would you be able to unmute them? Because I just made you a co-host. Um, oh, sure. If you want me to do that, fine. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. And then also, if you also have any questions and stuff like that, Jane will point out the breaks when she'll be, you know, receiving the questions. But mostly it's going to be our 20-minute presentation with some breaks in I get every 20 minutes or so. And then uh, when we will take a question, I will go over the rules as well. Okay, Thank you so I was just asked, gonna type, I was just typing in a question. I was wondering if you purposely rescheduled to today because of the, <clears throat> this is the anniversary of when Catherine came to power. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Did you purposely reschedule it for today for that reason? I, uh, it fell on that day, but if it, if it happens to be this way, then it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. By the way, is that, excuse me, is that old style date or new style date? I gave up on those. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I was just going by the almanac thing saying this was the anniversary. Um, hold, let me turn down my TV because I don't want to be bugging you guys. Hold on. That's fine. There we go. Is that more tolerable? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thank you so oh, okay. much. Okay. Because I have a fan on too. How are you, Jane? I've been looking forward to this. Me too. Jane is amazing and she does amazing research and uh, oh. we're blessed. Yeah, we're blessed to have her in our group. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. This is going to be a little bit of a different presentation, I'm afraid. So I hope it'll go okay. I think you'll do fine. You're, you make these women's lives very interesting. Also, uh, Betty, if you, you don't mind, um, you know, in about 15 minutes, I'll be silent. Would you be able to also admit people if there's people coming in? You just press um, admit. Yeah, sure. Is there any, I mean, do you do any screening or do you just let people in when it says they're waiting? No, just let them in because okay. I already, I already, uh, you know, put all the security measures in place. Okay, super. Yeah. Although we do occasionally get some creative bombers. All the time. They <laughs> love my podcast. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate you uh, trusting me to help out. I hope I do a good enough job. Yes, thing I appreciate so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to mute myself now so I don't bore everybody to death. Jane, let me just check uh, all the meetups to see if people uh, had any issues with the Zoom, okay?
All right. So uh, before we start, I just want to go over the rules. Um, so this is not an academic presentation, and um, we are um, just, you know, um, buffs, history buffs. And uh, the reason we're doing the uh, Catherine the Great or Catherine the, the Second is because, you know, we've been doing this uh, history of um, Russia uh, due to the fact that we're also doing Ukrainian um, you know, conflict uh, kind of updates and people had a lot of interest in it. And also we do a, a podcast on powerful women um, in history. And, um, you know, a Jane had taken up on her and she did the, the first podcast on um, Elizabeth. Um, uh, and now she's doing this one. And then we'll have uh, uh, maybe Nefertiti or Cleopatra somewhere in August, uh, or Sokaju from, um, you know, the 25th dynasty of Egypt. So basically all the powerful women. Um, and so just want to go over the rules, you know, be respectful. If you have any questions, you can either, if you want to uh, verbally ask a question, please raise your hand. If you want to ask a question through chat, uh, Patty would read the question to Jane, and you can ask question at any point uh, through chat. But and as far as asking it, um, you know, uh, verbally, you, you know, you're going to have to wait for the uh, intermission uh, when Jane will let you in. So without further ado, uh, I'm admitting people. Jane, you want to uh, go ahead and start and I can start recording? Jane? There we go. Okay. Well. Welcome to my second session of my series. Yes, I got it. Thank you. Welcome to my second session of my series on scandalous queens. In our last, we discussed Catherine de Medici. Today, we are going to talk about Catherine the Great. The premise of this series is that history is made on beds as well as battlefields and Catherine the Great is the poster child for that. In fact, I'd have to go 10,000 miles east to find anyone like her. Before we start, I'd like to ask you all for a little help. Can you tell me one thing you know about Catherine the Great and or one thing you'd like to know? A few people, please. Uh, raise hands if you'd like to comment. Well, going onward, in organizing this, I found it impossible to disentangle the love affairs from their political and global consequences. So we will do this today in three artificially separated parts. There will be love affairs and high drama and their part in making the history of Russia. But before we get there, I'll go over the run up to Catherine's reign. So you will know what kind of snake pit she fell into when she arrived at 15 years of age in Russia and understand how she managed to tame and use some of the surrounding serpents to become the empress. Then we will get into the scandal part, I promise, and afterwards, although there was no afterwards of scandal for Catherine on this side of the grave, we'll talk about how her regime played out. If you're in it only for the scandal, you can leave before part three and I won't be the least bit insulted. Here we go. The crown of Russia did not pass peacefully in the years before Catherine the Great became the Empress. The boyar, that is the creme de la creme of noble families, the landed gentry, of the two wives of the Emperor Alexei, warred after the sudden death in 1682 of the 20 year old Emperor Feodor III. Feodor, the Emperor, the elder son of Alexei's first wife, was disfigured and partly paralyzed from childhood, but he was mentally completely competent 
So there'd been no barrier to his reign and no regent needed because he was old enough. Theodore had no children, so the succession would normally pass to his younger brother, who was also the child of Alexei's first wife, so a full brother. However, 16-year-old Ivan had both crippling physical and mental afflictions, and so his younger half-brother, Peter, the son of Alexei's second wife, was chosen as emperor by the boyars. That's the elite in the landed nobles, as I said, their council. This precipitated a bloody struggle between the families of Alexei's two wives, in which Ivan's sister, Sophia, backed by the Streltsy, which was the regiment of Kremlin guards, succeeded in having Ivan named co-emperor with Peter and herself as regent for them both, a post she kept for years after even Peter was of age to rule. And let us go to slide two, which shows a scene in that, um, here you see Peter watching his uncle get um, dragged off to be murdered while his mother is sobbing. Sophia is looking very happy in the background. And so it was. Now over here, we will go to Theodore and then Peter and finally to Ivan, who's crowded under my view over there. That's better. Okay, and so continuing. The measures that Sophia took to suppress Peter's gradual assumption of authority Though he did succeed in forming two regiments of guards loyal to himself, culminated when she tried to recruit the Strelsi again, this time to have herself to Sklerage Sar. The Strelsi refused as Peter's two new regiments had become a formidable force in the opposition. In the end, Sophie was sent to a convent, yay, and her allies exiled. Ivan had ceased to be relevant and faded gradually away. The Strelsi made a serious attempt at regime change about 10 years later, when Peter was away in Europe. He returned post haste and publicly tortured them to death. We now speak of the rise of Marta Helena Skoranska, a woman after my own heart, born in Latvia in April, 1664. Her parents died when she was five years old <laughs> and she was adopted into the household of Lutheran pastor, Johann Ernest Gluck. He was the first translator of the Bible into Latvia, but he didn't make any effort to teach his ward to read or write. As a teenager, she worked as a maid in the household and was very briefly married to a Swedish soldier before the Swedes retreated from the Russian troops and left Latvia and also Marta under field marshal for Sheremetov. The troops took the pastor as a prisoner, a hired translator, and Marta accompanying them to Moscow. Apparently, she found companionship among the soldiers, possibly with Brigadier General Rudolf Bauer a come down in rank. In Moscow though, her rank was restored to field marshal field mattress when she joined the household of Prince Alexander Menshikov. I should mention that half of the accessible pictures of Catherine I look suspiciously like the Empress Anna and some few like the beautiful Empress Elizabeth. The one I have here, which I shall show you. Yes, the one I have here on my left, uh, which is your right, of Catherine and her hus ultimate husband, Peter I, and Menshikov, who is to pull all the strings, 
uh, comes from the, uh, it was on a postcard in the Boris Yeltsin Presidential Library. So maybe it's okay. You have to wonder about some of these things on Google. And after Peter died, Menchikov successfully promoted the continuance of Catherine, now Peter's wife, as empress. She was apparently happy with the empress perks, good food, good company, lots of shiny things. And Menchikov ruled the roost until she died. He easily engineered her successor, Peter II, a grandson of Peter the Great chosen because of gender, legitimacy of birth and age, in preference to Peter's surviving daughters, who were old enough to reign, Anna, the eldest by one year, and Elizabeth. The date of Peter and Catherine's marriage was uncertain. That was the excuse and might have followed rather than preceded their birth. Peter II was not only male, but more importantly, he was a malleable 12 years old. He would need a regent. Who could it be? Oh, Menshikov, of course, who also supplied the 14-year-old ruler with a wife, his daughter, Maria. However, Menshikov was becoming old and tween-aged Peter was resentful of his dominance. A palace coup took advantage of an illness of Menshikov to supplant him. Peter immediately divorced Maria and exiled Menshikov to Siberia. But before the new regime could settle in, Peter died of smallpox at the age of 14. Without the kingmaker, succession passed to the line of Ivan V. Remember him? He was the co-tsar with Peter. That's Peter the Great. Peter's surviving daughter, Elizabeth, and the son of his deceased daughter, Anna, were again passed over. Ivan V's disability had not kept him from procreation. He also had two daughters. The elder had a husband who was not acceptable to the boyar council, but her younger sister, Anna Ivanova, or Ivanova, had married the Duke of Courland, who was very acceptable because he died on their honeymoon. And Anna was said to be a docile creature. The Boyer Council was always looking for a child or docile person to become the emperor. So one of them could emerge from the ensuing scrimmage and be regent and run the show. Okay, and I have to catch you up on the slides. There is Peter II, isn't he beautiful? Okay, let us continue. Anna agreed to all their conditions. She couldn't remarry, she couldn't name her successor, both conditions designed to deprive her of a reliable ally. And she must rubber stamp all the decisions of the council. She smiled ever so sweetly while her lover and reliable ally, Ernst Johann Buren, secretly lined up 150 nobles to sign a petition against the conditions. Then she signed the paper and immediately and publicly tore the paper with conditions up. Biren became her high chancellor and ran the show for her. Empress Anna reigned for 10 years, a period of plagues, famines, and brutal repression. One estimate has it between 20 and 30,000 human beings were exiled to Siberia. The public brutality rivaled Peter's the great suppression of the Strelsi. As an example, two noble women who were accused of conspiring against her, though it was never proved, were publicly stripped naked and flogged, and then their tongues were torn out and what remained of them exiled to Siberia. 
Of course, noble people were just not supposed to have this happen to her. Another episode. She forced a newlywed noble couple she didn't like to pass their wedding night in an ice house, complete with ice furniture and an ice tea set. They escaped their intended demise by trading the bride's pearl necklace for a guard sheets and coat. Nobles were supposed to be exempt from ice houses too. There were consequences. Before she died in October 1740, Empress Anna had adopted Ivan, the newborn son of her niece, Anna Leopoldovna, and designated him to be her successor. No doubt the Cherish Viren, who would then have continued as regent for many quiet years, Ivan being only two months old. Ivan's mother, Anna Leopoldovna, was seriously pissed at being passed over. She had always been told she would be the next empress, and a coup followed a month later, ousting Buren, who was hated throughout Russia, and installing her as regent, that is Anna Leopoldovna, for the kid. Without a Buren of her own, however, this Anna was vulnerable. What ended her regency and the reign of little Ivan VI after 13 months was a rumor that she was going to send the regiments of guards away from Moscow. The regiments became alarmed. Fortunately, right to hand was Elizabeth Peter's long passed over daughter, who had been nicknamed the godmother of the guards for her kindnesses to them, no doubt of all varieties. And so another coup followed and installed Godmother Elizabeth as Empress of Russia. Now, let me catch you up on some slides here. Here's the ice house. As you can see, they don't look happy. The others are cheering. This guy is Biren. Uh, here's little Ivan the Sixth. And here is Anna. And I believe that one is Ivanovna or Ivanovna. Here is the Empress Elizabeth. And talk about gorgeous. I mean, really. She loved to dress up in men's clothes because she was so tall and she looked wonderful. And now to continue. Little Ivan that we just saw was packed off to a prison cell with a stipulation that he would be killed if he ever tried to escape. 23 years of solitary confinement later, someone tried to liberate him. And following Elizabeth's instructions, Ivan's guards ended his life. There hadn't been much left of him at that point, either physically or mentally. So let's summarize. Transition one, Theodore to Peter Ivan, Emperor Tag Team, via Strauss Rebellion, Peter watches murder of his uncle, it's very violent. Transition two, Peter the Great to wife Catherine the First. Opponents of Catherine the First tried to get her uh, puppeteer Menshikov silenced by the Prayobrzezinski guards unsuccessfully violent. Transition number three, Catherine the first to Peter the second. Hey, peaceful. Transition four, Peter the second to Anna the first, Empress Anna, with Baroness puppeteer, violent. Transition, Anna to Ivan the sixth, aged two months with Baroness Regent, who overthrows, both of them, Anna becomes regent. This is Anna Leopoldovna. I know it's confusing, I apologize. Extra legal. Transition next, Ivan VI to Elizabeth, facilitated by the Preobrzezinski and Sarah Guard Regiment, and that is violent. Scorecard, mostly violent. By the way, if you notice some a resemblance between the Prairie Guards 
and the Praetorian Guard of Emperor, Imperial Rome, you're absolutely not alone. Okay. We have two important things to notice. One, if you want to be the emperors, either you or your lover had to line up the palace guard behind you, and you had to have some support in the council of boyars. Two, it was not guaranteed that the female gender ensured docility. Of all the females involved, only Catherine I lived up to expectations in that regard. And she proved that by putting up with Peter and his three-room log cabin for five years while they were waiting for the contractors to finish their new home. And catching you up on some slides over here. This is the log cabin. Well, you might say, hey, that's not log cabin, that's made out of brick, it isn't. They, um, <laughs> the bricks are painted on. And by the way, it's been spruced up considerably since I was there walking across the park and finding this with a sign on it saying, as far as I could see, it was the summer palace. I was so disappointed because the summer palace, which is what Peter constructed for their new home, was this. And nobody ever sees that. I mean, as far as this one is concerned, Versailles looks like somebody's back bedroom. Here we have these magnificent fountains. Uh, yeah, here we go. A little closer. And just so you can get a really good view of them, here we are again. And let me assure you that the inside matches all the way through. So, continuing onward, we have a discussion break. Did somebody want to ask questions, raise hands, put something in the chat? Anybody has any questions for Jane, uh, please ask or raise your hand and we will uh, post it. I guess the first question I have, uh, Jane, I know you, you must have already spoke about the lineage but can you talk a little bit of background, where she came from, how important was this? Um, I guess there was a 39, 39, 39 parts to the Germany uh, at the time. It was very sparse uh, society and was not united. And I guess her father, um, Catherine the Great Father, was um, one of the... Um, uh, was just a regular governor. He was not even... Uh, a duke. Um, I mean, he was duke according to the uh, to the title, but he was just a regular cleric, so to speak. Um, if you know any of the background, that to speak, and also talk about. Um, I think you're probably going to get to that, Peter, right? Um, oh the, yeah. Uh, well, that's exactly what I'm going to cover in my next. And actually, I, you know, the sources are so mixed up. Um, if you go to Wikipedia, it's hopeless. Everything's wrong. What I did was I used uh, Catherine's memoirs. I used the memoirs of Poniatowski. I used uh, the memoirs of Dashkova and also um, the memoirs of the head of the French legation and letters therefrom. And you will get different opinions. Now, so take what you like and leave the rest. Um, she, according to my sources, she was born Princess Sophia Frederica August in Anhalt Zerbs, which is in Saxony, in 1729. And I go on from there. Is that, um, does that help? And I'll go on from there, believe me. Um, <clears throat> Jane. I'm not sure if you can answer this. I'm very vague on the difference between old date and new date. Do you know when that changed and, and 
or can you amplify anything about that? Yes. Um, you'll, you noticed I didn't give exact dates because I don't want to get into the old style and new style date every time I give one. There was a revolution in the Russian Orthodox Church in the middle of the 17th century, which is not so far from where we are. And in fact, Catherine seems to date her um, dates old style in her letters. And uh, that included moving to the European time rather than Russian. As always, there were a whole bunch of people who refused to go along with that newfangled stuff. And the Russian holdouts took the name of old believers and they became quite a pain. Well, this occurred in Russia after it had already occurred in the West. That was what I was confused about. Oh no, that old one, that was Gregory, I believe way back when. Okay, but I mean, the, the West was already on the new time or new, okay. Yes. That was what I was confused about. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, I'll give this another five seconds and go on. The Empress Elizabeth designated Peter, the Holstein Gottwald born son of her elder sister to be her heir. Perhaps she wanted to make it up to Anna Petrovna for being passed over and over and over as empress. Further, she um, acquiesced in Peter's obsession with Germany and desire for, the, for a German-speaking bride, prefer preferentially Prussia, because of course there wasn't a Germany at that time. Peter was obsessed with Prussia. Frederick the Great referred to himself as Peter's Dulcinea, which is not really a nice remark. Thus, Peter insisted on a German wife. He had been brought up in Holstein. He spoke German in preference to both Russian and the Russian court language French. Or maybe Elizabeth simply thought it would be a good diplomatic move. Although Sophie was a princess, Anhalt Zerbst in Saxony is not a very important or imposing place. And I have for you. Okay, first let's take a look at what she looked like when she came to Russia. And then, that's her on the right, and that's the adorable Peter Knott. And here we are. This was her home, and I've even put an arrow over what she, in her memoirs, mentions was her quarters there, the um, third dormer over here from the end. All right, let me go back and put this on for you. Since the usual game of royal marriage is to gain territory or important allies, Sophie was not much of a catch. In a way though, it was in Catherine's favor that she was not a very grand person because it was expected that she would be quite docile when confronted with the splendor of the Russian court. Some people just never learn. Catherine was on board with the idea from square one. She read everything about Russia she could get her hands on and dreamed of being empress in this faraway mysterious place. She had promised her father she would always keep her Lutheran faith. But she must have had her fingers crossed behind her back because she never protested when told she would have to become Russian Orthodox. As Henri Kott famously said, Moscow was worth a mess. Only he said Paris, of course. Um, this is an excerpt from the letter she sent her father after her conversion, which took place before her marriage was required. And I find almost no difference between the Greek and Lutheran faiths. I have decided upon examining your highness's gracious instructions to convert 
and I shall send you my protestation of faith at my first opportunity, your most obedient daughter. Ah, one can only stand in some silence at this precocious mastery of sophistry written by a 15 year old girl. It would stand her in good stead for the rest of her life. Okay, she is now the Grand Duchess. Little Sophie and her mother had endured the long, cold and bumpy trip to Russia in the meeting with her intended bridegroom in 1744. He was 16 years old with a long skinny face, as you see, a big nose, yes, and an exceedingly unattractive wig, if that is a wig, at least according to contemporary portraits. His rambunctious playfulness and social immaturity was disconcerting to the studious German princess. Sophie became the Grand Duchess Ekaterina from the time of her conversion and engagement to the Grand Duke Peter, heir to the Russian throne. Peter remained Peter. And I love to do some, some diagnosis here. Um, you never stop being a counselor. Actually, he met all of the DSM criterion for autism spectrum with ADHD and apparently had the kind that survives into adulthood. He greeted Sophie by telling her he was in love with one of the court ladies. His total lack of empathy, keeping him blissfully unaware that a fiance might be distressed by such a revelation. Of course, love affairs outside of marriage were common in the Russian court and frequently flaunted. So one shouldn't put too much stress on this. Morality had been much stricter than Anhalt Zerbs though. And Catherine's memoirs record that she was upset to hear him talk of his latest beloved as, as they changed frequently at this time. His pastimes were equally distressing to her. Peter was given a troop of soldiers and had them as well as himself outfitted in Prussian uniforms. They loved that. This was rather tactless since Russian had recently participated in the first Silesian war, 1740-42 as an ally of Austria, Great Britain and the Netherlands against Prussia. When Peter was not putting his troops through maneuvers, he played on his bed with toy soldiers. He had a troop of hunting dogs, which he would incite into races in his bedroom, at this point adjacent to Catherine's, and augmented their baying by whipping and punishing them so that they squealed loudly. He also played the violin badly and demanded audiences and I fervently hope one could tell the violin from the dogs. He bored holes into his aunt's, that's Empress Elizabeth's bedroom, to watch her with her lovers and invited his friends to watch alongside. Elizabeth found out about this and was not amused. He made a little guillotine, or had it made for him most likely, which decapitated rats for Catherine's amusement and rather had the adverse effect. As the time for the wedding approached, Peter lost interest in visiting his fiance. No doubt he had interests more pressing. However, the marriage date approached as planned. Um, and still, Catherine became an empress, and Peter, or Tsaritsa, actually, and Peter remained Peter. And here is something for us all to envy, which is Catherine's wedding dress. And yes, that has been measured and it is a 16 inch waist. And here is the Kazan Cathedral, which is where the marriage took place. And it will be also where she was acclaimed as empress. So you can remember that. And here is now her a few years later 
she's in her twenties and she is now Tsaritsa. Okay, continuing. Catherine admits in her memoirs that she really wanted to be Empress and would have put up with almost anything. To quote her, as this day of the wedding, July 17th, old or new, <laughs> 1743 approached, I grew more deeply melancholic. My heart did not foretell great happiness. Ambition alone sustained me. At the bottom of my soul, I had something, I knew not what, that never for a single moment let me doubt that sooner or later, I would succeed in becoming the sovereign empress of Russia in my own right. Things got worse after the marriage, if possible. Catherine's interfering, expensive, and gambling addition, addicted mother, was given a cold and accusatory send-off by Elizabeth, according to court gossip recorded by the English ambassador. Well, the mother may have been a nuisance to everybody, including Catherine, but Catherine could at least anticipate that she was sort of on her side. Fifteen days after the ceremony, Peter told Catherine that he was in love with Elizabeth's maid of honor, ordered by the empress to take a bath, not apparently a Prussian custom at the time. He protested so violently that the dispute was reported to the empress who replied by voicing her displeasure at the lack of Catherine's pregnancy and wanted to know whose fault that was. Although it seems to me already she had one good answer. Since the first duty of the Grand Duke and Duchess was to produce an heir to the throne, I'm sorry, she was not empress at this time. She was empress when Peter uh, succeeded to the throne. Sorry about that slip. Um, and thus impossible, given the lack of the essential precursor, it was not long before questions arose regarding Catherine's state of non-pregnancy. Both she and Peter were subjected to physical examinations. Catherine was found to be quite normal, and certain adjustments were made to Peter's anatomy. A strict watch had always been kept on the couple, particularly Catherine. The Empress Elizabeth had attached a woman, Madame Choglatkova, to her retinue as chaperone, housekeeper, and spy. Both Peter and Catherine loathed her. When Catherine became friendly with a lieutenant in Peter's military troop, who often visited Peter's room and in fun addressed Catherine as mother while she called him son, the relationship was reported by Choglakova and taken seriously enough to have this young man put in house arrest along with his two brothers and all three of them exiled. When Catherine became close to one of her ladies in waiting, Elizabeth had the woman removed and sent to Astrakhan, which is very far away. Peter drilled his troop of Hessian human soldiers to his heart's content and their exhaust. He cheated at cards. He ignored his wife and stayed out drinking most nights with the soldiers. Six years later, there was still no baby. Elizabeth was furious. She sacked this whole staff of the Grand Duke and Duchess and packed their household, not Shobokova, of course, with more spies. Finally, she called a doctor and had Peter examined once more. He had a condition called phimosis that was interfering, physical interference. He had a surgical fix. As it was, it didn't work to produce an heir because Peter was trying out his new skill set on his new mistress, Elizabeth Voronsova, described by his on the contemporaries as both ugly and fat. And here she is, and I don't think she's that bad. Um, you can judge for yourself. Peter began to humiliate his wife in public. Meanwhile, Choglakova 
offered her a piece of advice along with a strong hint that it came from higher up. Here is Catherine's account of it. In the meanwhile, Madame Shogakov, who never lost sight of her favorite project of watching over the succession, took me aside one day and said, listen to me, I must speak to you with all sincerity. I opened my eyes and ears and not without cause. She began with a long preamble after her fashion, respecting her attachment to her husband, her own prudent conduct, what was necessary and not necessary for ensuring mutual love, and facilitating conjugal love. And there she went on to say that occasionally there were situations in which a higher interest demanded an exception to the rule. I let her talk on without interruption, not knowing what she was driving at, a good deal astonished and uncertain whether it was not a snare she was laying for me or whether she was speaking with sincerity. Just as I was making these reflections in my own mind, she said to me, you shall presently see whether I love my country and whether I am sincere. I do not doubt, but you have cast an eye of preference on someone or other. I leave you to choose between Sergei Soltikov and Leon Narishkin. Narishkin being of the, both of them really of the highest uh, nobility and Narishkin being of the family, um, one of whose protagonists you saw dragged away in that one of the first slides by the Streltsy. If I do not mistake, went on Chobakova, it is the latter. Here I exclaimed, no, no, not at all. Well, then, she said, if it be not Narishkin, it is Saltikov. To that I made no reply, and she went on saying, you shall see, it will not be I who will throw difficulties in your way. I played the simpleton to such a degree that she scolded me for it several times, both in town and in the country where we went after Easter. Soltikov came down, came from a family whose nobility was among the highest in Russia, and he was more than willing. We should take a look at him. There he is. Soltikov. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, here is Catherine's description of their up there from her memoirs. During one of these concerts, Sir Shvotika gave me to understand what was the object of his assiduous attentions. I didn't reply to him at first. When he again returned to the subject, I asked him what it was he wanted of me. Hereupon he drew a charming and passionate picture of the happiness which he promised himself. I said to him, but your wife, whom you married for love only two years ago and of whom you were supposed to be passionately fond and she too of you, what will she say of this? He replied that all was not gold that glitters and that he was paying dearly for a moment of infatuation. I did all I could to make him change his mind. I really expected to succeed in this. I pitied him, unfortunately. I listened also. He was very handsome and certainly had not his equal at the imperial court, still less at ours. He was not wanting in mind, nor in that finish of accomplishment, manner, and a style which the great world gives, and especially at court. He was 26 years old. Take him all in all. He was by birth and many other qualities, a distinguished gentleman. As for her faults, he managed to hide them. The greatest of all was a love intrigue and a want of principle. These, of course, were not unfolded to my eyes. I held out all spring and part of the autumn. I saw him almost every day and made no change in my conduct toward him. I was the same to him as I was to all others and never saw him but in the presence of the court or of a part of it. One day to get rid of him, I made up my mind to tell him that he was misdirecting his attention. I said, how do you know that my heart is not engaged elsewhere? 
This, however, instead of discouraging him, only made his pursuit all the more ardent. In all of this, there was no thought of the dear husband, that is Peter, for it was known and admitted back that he was not at all amiable, even to the object whom he was in love. And he was always in love. In fact, he might be said to pay the court to every woman except the one who bore the name of his wife. She alone was excluded from all share of his attentions. In the midst of all this, Chovlikov, that's the husband of Chovlikova, invited us to a hunting party on his island, whither we went in a skiff, our horses being sent on before. Immediately on our arrival, I mounted my horse and we went to find the dogs. Soltikov seized the moment when the rest were in pursuit of the hares to approach me and speak of his favorite subject. I listened more attentively than usual. He described to me the plan which he had arranged for enshrouding, as he said, in profound misery, his happiness, which might be enjoyed in such a case. I did not say a word. He took advantage of my silence to persuade me that he loved me passionately, and he begged that I would allow him to hope, at least that he was not wholly indifferent to me. I told him he might amuse himself with hoping what he pleased, as I could not prevent his thoughts. Finally, he drew comparisons between himself and others at the court and made me confess that he was preferable to them. From that, he included that he was preferred. I laughed at all this, but I admitted that he was agreeable to me. At the end of an hour and a half's conversation, I desired him to leave me since so long a conversation might give rise to suspicion. He said he would not go unless I told him I consented. I answered, yes, yes, but go away. He said, then it is settled and put spurs to his horse. I cried after him, no, no, but he repeated, yes, yes. And thus we separated. On our return to the house, such a heavy gale from the sea came in that the wave rose so high that it even reached the steps of the house. In fact, the whole island was under the water to the depth of several feet. We were obliged to remain until the storm had abated and the waters retreated, which was not until two or three in the morning. How incredibly romantic, who among us could resist? However, some weeks later, she writes, it seemed to me that Serge Soltikov was beginning to relax in his attentions, that he became absent, sometimes absurd, arrogant, and dissipated. I was vexed at this and spoke to him on the subject. He gave me but poor excuses and pretended that I did not understand the extreme cleverness of his conduct. He was right, for I did think it strange enough. We were told to get ready for the journey to Moscow, which we did. We left St. Petersburg on the 14th of December, 1752. Saltikov remained behind and did not follow us for several weeks. I left the city with some slight indications of pregnancy. We traveled very rapidly day and night. At the last stage before reaching Moscow, these signs disappeared with violent spasms. On her arrival and seeing the turn things were taken, I felt satisfied that I had a miscarriage. The affair continued, however, and Catherine, without fully realizing, revealing the identity of the father, she knew perfectly well, of course, gave birth to the child who would become Emperor Paul I. Upon the delivery, the Empress Elizabeth asked no questions, but immediately took the baby back to her rooms and kept it there and later let Catherine know that she would have time with her son twice a year. Catherine herself was abandoned on the bloodstained bed for hours with the windows open to the cold October wind. This was Russia. The Grand Duke was drunk 
and Soltikov discreetly absent. He was shortly sent on a mission to Sweden. Alone amidst the scandal, the social world, Catherine had to depend on her friends for company. Among them was the English envoy, Charles Hanbury Williams. He was to become a long-term friend of Catherine and they exchanged letters for years after his departure from Russia. Now she poured out her many troubles to Hanbury Williams when the intrigues at court and her horrendous marriage got too much for him, for her. Reading his dispatches and his liaison back home, Lord Holderness wondered aloud if the two were having an affair. Alas, reported Charles, at my age, my scepter governs no more. Still, we have the letters that he wrote to her, and I quote one of them. My heart, my life, my soul are yours. I adore you, and my adoration goes so far that I am persuaded that I can have no merit apart from you. When he returned to Russia, he brought her Stanislaus Augustus. And Yatovsky. And that I am told is 24. Let me get down there. Okay. Okay, there's um, Charles Hanbury Williams, and there's Poniatowski. Oh, is he gorgeous? Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Poniatowski came from a family of the highest Polish nobility. Among his tutors was Count Kaiserling, who is most remembered today for commissioning Johann Sebastian Bach's Goldberg Variations. Poniatowski accompanied the Russian army when they marched across Germany during the War of the Austrian Succession, and perhaps even aimed a gun at the, conqueror, at the composer. <laughs> who knows? Poniatowski quickly became a member of Catherine's Abulian Circle and a participant in their secret parties. Saltikov at this point was more or less history with Catherine because of incessant infidelities and consequent neglect. After the description of her sojourn with Saltikov on the deserted island, along with the tantalizing illusions regarding Paul's paternity, her memoirs are remarkably discreet about later relationships with men, but she certainly had an affair with Poniatowski, lucky girl. Poniatowski described the beginning of the affair in his memoirs. He socialized with Catherine's young and playful circle of friends. They observed his shy looks and her shy smiles. And one evening, Count Narishka escorted Poniatowski to her apartment. The door being ajar, by arrangement, I'm sure, he pushed the reluctant lover in and slammed the door behind. According to Poniatowski, she wore a white gown trimmed with pink lace, and he dreamed of that gown until his dying day. Poniatowski worshipped Catherine, and she basked in the warmth of this attachment. Her first experience of actual love from another human being. The relationship continued on December 9th, older new style, 1757, Catherine gave birth to Poniatowski's daughter, Anna Petrovna, um, <laughs> maybe, who survived only 15 months. Empress Elizabeth pretended to believe the child was Peter's and rewarded him with 60,000 rubles and then asked the King of Poland to recall Poniatowski. Poniatowski made all kinds of excuses not to leave. He was sick, he was almost dying. But the Grand Duke, that's Peter, and his entourage caught him leaving Catherine's apartment in the small hours of the morning. Shortly thereafter, he was sent back to Poland. Catherine was desitate for a day or two. Poniatowski was to reemerge in her life later on, as we shall see. One day, in the meantime, Catherine was at her window. She happened to see a tall Ismailowski guardsman passing by, and he glanced up. This was the beginning 
of her affair with Gregory Orlov. And let's catch up on the slides. Gregory was the second oldest of the five Orlov brothers, all of whom became devoted to Catherine. He had already distinguished himself both in battle and in the boudoir, but he abandoned all his prior loves when his affair with her began. Meanwhile, the Empress Elizabeth was becoming more and more unwell. Poniatowski was away and Peter was starting to hint at replacing Catherine with Voronceva when his aunt died. Without Elizabeth's protection, Catherine could not hope to live very long. Catherine studied survival. She pretended to be friendly with Elizabeth Voronceva, her husband's mistress. She helped with and then took over Peter's administrative duties at Duke of Holstein, for which he was too drunk or busy with amusement. As a reward, she was allowed to see her son Paul once a week and watch him play in the garden. Catherine had to find new friends. Among them was a charming and passionate teenage princess, 10 years younger than Catherine, whose uncle, Michael Voronsov, happened to be vice chancellor of Russia and whose husband was an officer of Peter's guards. The name of this new friend was Princess Catherine Voronsova Dashko. She was also the sister of Peter's mistress, a very useful friend indeed. What should we say of Princess Dashko? She, at great risk, was the liaison between Catherine to the Orlovs before and during the coup. She was the first one notified of Pasek's arrest, we'll get to that, and she set the coup in motion. She rode along Catherine at the head of the troops. Almost immediately afterwards, though, Catherine was distancing herself and had not even put Dashkova on the list for a seat at her coronation in Moscow, a significant humiliation. Her discovery that as Dashkova's afterwards that Catherine and Gregory would love her, she had no idea, completed her disillusionment. Here is Rulier, remember him? He was the um, chairman of the French legation. France was not particularly a fan of Catherine. She has lost, that is Stashkova, at an age so tender, all the illusions of fortune and friendship and of glory. Humiliation has blighted that ardent and generous character, which prompted her to sacrifice her family, which inspired her with enthusiasm and credulity which in her first emotions of dissatisfaction with the Empress drew from her the declaration, I knew, I thought I was acting right, but I deceived myself. The long disgrace which she has undergone has soured her temper without her daring henceforth to wear the appearance of discontent. She full retains that same ardor of spirit which carried her to the barracks which made her assume a man's dress and ride at the head of an army. I have nowhere spoken of her beauty, her age and the, she then possessed all the luster of it, supplied the place of beauty at the time that I had spoken of. Many years later, while living in Switzerland, Dashkova wrote her own memoirs and made Catherine very angry. Catherine accused her of taking the credit for the coup that made her empress. In Dashkova's memoir, she describes this and their relations in better times as when she brought good news to Catherine and the two of them fell together on the bed in an embrace where they remained motionless for several minutes. They shared emotional in intimacy, or at least Dashkova thought they did. In later years, perhaps to make amends, Catherine appointed the princess of the head of the Russian Academy of Sci Sciences. Catherine also became publicly devout. Peter split his time between drinking bouts and hangovers. 
drilling his Prussian costume troops and betting Baranza. There was no time for church. Worse yet, he proclaimed religious freedom an absolute non-starter for the Russian Orthodox priesthood, to say the least. They suspected him of secret Lutheranism. And by the way, they were right. Catherine was their favorite. The Empress Elizabeth was declining in health. Catherine sat at her bedside every day. Peter visited twice and made jokes with his friends. Catherine was five months pregnant with Gregory's child, which she delivered four months later and then Alexei Grigorovich. Talk about nerve. This is perhaps the reason that she has been accused of betting both Gregory and his brother Alexei and even the rest of the brothers, but it's more likely it was just a way of thanking Alexei for his help in the coup. And to continue, on January 5th, old or new, 1762, Empress Elizabeth died. On April 11th, 1762, Catherine gave birth to Gregory Orlov's child. On May 5th, Emperor Peter III of Russia signed a treaty ending the Seven Years' War with Prussia. On July 8th, 1762, Catherine became the Empress of Russia, again with apologies, old or new. This is how it happened. Over the preceding years, Catherine had been building a coalition. Do you remember way back when, when we went over the succession of the crown before Catherine, we noticed two important things. Either you or your sponsor had to line up the palace guard behind you and you needed the support of the nobility. And if you were female, you had to have a strong male figure. Hello, Gregory, promote you in hopes he would become the de facto head of state. Princess Dashkova was Catherine's link to the nobility, particularly Mikhail Vorontsov, Elizabeth's chancellor. It didn't hurt that Dashkova's husband was a high ranking officer in the guards. Grigory Orlov and his brothers had been quite busy spreading the gospel of Catherine amongst their companions in the palace guard, already grumbling at the incessant drills and Prussian uniforms. Catherine enlisted Hanbury Williams from England, convincing him to back a coup, but he thought it would be in favor of little Paul with her selfish region, promising that her reign would be friendly to England. He provided her with 10,000 pounds sterling, and she did what Hanbury Williams requested of her, such as bringing him information and thwarting diplomatic exchange between Russia and France, the enemy of England. Naturally, Catherine never told her other supporters about this because it was actually treasonable activity, but Hanbury Williams became ill in 1759 and went home they're becoming mad and dying that same year. In contrast to Peter's support of religious choice in Russia, Catherine became the guardian, yes, he was, yes, he did. Catherine became the guardian of the faith, at least the clergy thought so. Until as empress, she secularized large tracts of church-owned lands. <sighs> Catherine somehow, kept her supporters in total ignorance of the involvement of all the others. She, she alone was the prime mover. Each faction, guards, church, military, nobles, important individuals was allowed to think it was the favored one that would control her when the coup succeeded. At very least, be rewarded handsomely for their support. She even convinced them that the coup was their own original idea. No doubt Mikhail Moransov thought he would be Catherine's chancellor and minister. Elizabeth's favorite, Nikita Panin, whom she had, uh, that is Elizabeth, had appointed governor of little Grand Duke Paul, supported Catherine's coup, believing that she would step aside for Paul and that he, Panin, would be regent. Panin was influential in the diplomatic corps and became Catherine's diplomatic advisor after 
that. Well, it's something. Meanwhile, what was Peter, remember him, doing? He'd already alienated the church, but the kids to raise his stunts in that ill-considered policy was refusal to be crowned in Moscow or any Orthodox cathedral, which was extremely stupid because that made him vulnerable to the charge of not being anointed by the church and therefore not being entitled to the throne. The treaty, it was never brought up until after the coup. The treaty with Prussia caused him the support of the army, the nobles and the common people, not that they counted. Russia had done well in the war. After three costly and ineffective sieges by the Russian Navy, Fyodor Lumyansev's ground troops had broken through the Prussian resistance and given Russia her first Baltic port. Yay, if you're Russian. Peter's treaty, which returned Kohlberg to Prussia, set all that effort and all those soldiers' sacrifice to naught. And here is them at work, and it doesn't look very nice. I've already mentioned how Peter angered the Prevenshtensky guards by replacing their brilliant red and gold uniforms with those of the dull Prussian blue style, too light for the Russian climate in any case, by drilling them half to death, and finally by referring to Frederick of Prussia as our master. Frederick referred to himself as Peter's Don Quixote and himself as Peter's Dulcinea, as I've already said. Peter angered practically everybody else by vowing to take Russia to war to bring back the province of his birth, Holstein from the Swedes. Nobody cared. And meanwhile, the Swedes were quite a uh, problem to Russia now and forever. They just finished the war and they surely didn't want another. He even alienated Voronsova by starting to treat her as he had his wife. One night at a court dinner, he screamed at Catherine and called her Dura, a fool, at that time the worst of Russian insults. He began to speak more frequently of having her arrested. Her group of new friends, the Orlov, Stashkova, Peter's old tutor, Panim, and Razumovsky, the brother of the Empress Elizabeth's lover, advised her to attempt a coup, not that she didn't have it in mind. Well, of course, Panin and Razumovsky wanted to act so that little Paul would be declared emperor. But Catherine really had different ideas and she was already acting on them. The conspirators organized. The original plan was a simple assassination. Several noble families followed Voronsov's lead. The Orlov brothers recruited within the palace guards. Days before the coup, they had enlisted 40 officers and over a thousand common soldiers. My source said 10,000, but I have amended it. Um, divided in four factions, which typical of Catherine's modus operandi were ignorant of one another. Among the recruits was a Captain Pasha, who was overheard being told about a coup. When he failed to report it and possibly passed it on, he was arrested and the Orlovs realized they had only hours before he broke under torture and revealed everything he knew. There are several versions of what happened next. Catherine's memoirs aren't one of them because they end three years before, but Catherine describes the coup in a letter to Poniatowski sent through Austrian diplomatic channels for secrecy. The other contemporary accounts that I've found on are by de Bruyere, head of the French legation in Russia, and thus called his memoirs. They disagree on many points with each other and which with the most popular our time biography of Catherine by Robert Massey. Despite that, given the times of travel from place to place and a healthy spirit of take what you like and leave the rest regarding these accounts, we can pretty be sure that something like the following took place. Here we have a map of all the places involved. Okay, 
um, from the Peterhof. So they were Iranian bound, which is now apparently called Moscow, Menshikovsky Volrets, is a distance of about eight to 10 miles. The distance from Menshikovsky Volrets by boat to the island um, where, which was a naval base and which Peter could hope for support is another five miles. Uh, the distance uh, to the Winter Palace is um, well, you could walk to the Peterhof in about eight hours, 47 minutes. They didn't have to do that. And another six hours walk would get you to Kazan Cathedral and the Winter Palace. So you see how tight that was. On the night of July 7th, 1762, Catherine was sleeping in a modest cottage on the Peterhof grounds, that is over here, yes. Peter with, was with Baranceva at the Oranian bell, over here. At 1 a.m., and I believe that this is, that's the Oranian bell, a sort of summer cottage, you know. Um, at 1 a.m. on July 8th, the sky was still blue, light enough to make one's way around the Peterhof. Don't forget this was one of the white nights. And she awoke to furious knocking at her door. Alexei Orlov was there with the news of Pasek's arrest. Alexei had first notified Dashkova that was their process. And she had put the plan in motion herself. The carriage and horses she'd secretly provided was in readiness. Alexei galloping alongside all three of them raced to the barracks of the Ismailovsky regiment. Gregory joined the soldiers who gathered around Catherine to kiss her hands and swear an oath of fealty. Then to the barracks of the Semyonovsky guards in St. Petersburg, uh, that would have been at the Winter Palace and the Kazan Cathedral where she had married Grand Duke Peter. And now, where the Metropolitan, alerted by the Orlogs, was waiting to proclaim her empress. The bells of the cathedral rang out over St. Petersburg, and now riding at the head of the regiments, they made for the Winter Palace, guarded by the elite Preobrazhensky guards. The regiment was wavering. Excuse me, that should be the Summer Palace, of course. How did I do that? The regiment was wavering. Catherine and her forces confronted them. Weapons were drawn. And then, out of the total silence, Menshikov, son of the man who put Catherine in power, raised his arm and cried, Long live Empress Catherine. And the Prebrzezhenskys fell cheering into line behind her. Now Catherine put on their uniform the old uniform, not the Prussian one. A handsome soldier found her a sword knot, the tassel for a, which is the tassel for the sword hilt. She led the ride to the Iranian wall. Peter was not at home. He had tried to escape by boarding the Royal Barge, hoping to reach the nearby naval base on the island of Kronstadt, only a few miles away. But there was a chain across the harbor entrance. A messenger from Catherine's ranks had been received. The guard ordered Peter to turn back. I am your emperor, he declared. We have no emperor, the guard replied. Long live Catherine the second. Game and match. Peter turned back and wrote to Catherine, offering to share power with her. It was a non-starter. Instead, she wrote back to him, enclosing a letter for him to sign. It was a total abdication. The reason being that he was incapable of ruling Russia and had brought only 
disgrace. He actually signed anything to stay alone. Peter was surrounded by his Holstein troops. Why did he lie down and play dead? Their commander, Munich, assured him he would win if he resisted. The answer is very simple. For all the years of playing at command, the marching and maneuvers on parade gowns, Peter was a coward. By playing dead, he hoped to avoid being so. He wasn't playing for time. Catherine was unsure what to do with him. He wanted to go to a small palace called Robsha, and Alexei offered to guard, guard him there. Peter was dead within a week. Poniatowski, firmly dissuaded by Catherine from rushing to her side as hopefully offered, kept a letter from Catherine describing the coup and Alexei's account of her husband deteriorated over the week of his captivity from indigestion and a drinking bout, followed by a hemorrhoidal colic, brain seizures, and then death. Peter had requested a Lutheran priest. See, I told you so, but none was sent for. An official autopsy reported hemorrhoidal stroke as cause of death and found no trace of poison. I'd better reassure anyone listening with a problem that the mortality rate from hemorrhoids is, and then was, zero. In Catherine's papers, Paul found a letter from Alexei with an almost incoherent apology for Peter's death in a fist fight begun too quickly for Alexei to stop the fatal blow, thus contradicting the autopsy <coughs> and Catherine's letter to Pete Poniatowski. Rulier's more dramatic account is of a supposedly friendly visit from two supporters sent by Catherine. Brandy was offered all round and one of them dropped poison into Peter's glass. As he was writhing and screaming on the ground, his guards ran up and ended his agony by strangulation. Rulier, of course, was French diplomat and the French diplomats were not big friends with Catherine. For whatever reason, Peter III stopped breathing by July 17th and was no longer a nuisance or a threat to anyone. Catherine was crowned as Assumption Cathedral in Moscow. This is the Kazan where she, Cathedral where she was a uh, acclaimed autocrat. And this, of course, is the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg that I've been talking about. And this is Assumption. Cathedral in Moscow. Her coup was complete. Gregory Orlon, now installed as Empress Pet, became unstable and arrogant. Catherine understood, as had Elizabeth, the Elizabeths of England and of Russia, that her marriage would transfer power to her spouse. She knew Orlov couldn't govern Russia. His attentions weakened and his demands were insistent. He was sometimes unfaithful. Finally, Catherine sent him away on a diplomatic mission, which he loused up because of his arrogance, which he uh, had acquired as her favorite. In the interim, there was Vasilchov to come. He was a captain in the guards and almost everything that recommended him can be seen in the photo or what actually painted. Still, he was available and was soon in an apartment adjoining Catholics. Alexei alerted Gregory to the situation and he dropped his negotiation, raced back to St. Petersburg, where he was stopped at the entrance to the city and told he couldn't enter. He was to quarantine at his estate. A month later, the quarantine was lifted. Kath but one evening at court told him the way the land lay and he asked Catherine for permission to go traveling, which he granted, no doubt, inducing a sigh of relief from everyone at court. If melting eyes and bedroom prowess had been enough for Catherine, Vasil Chikov might have continued as the chosen one. He sure had them. 
She wanted someone with whom she could talk, share the burdens of command and the constant decisions required of her. Vasilchikov lasted a year and 10 months. And at the end, she was over both Orlov and him. His labors with the empress had been profitable. He received an outright gift of 100,000 rubles, uh, had had a salary of 12,000 rubles yearly that was continued, a country estate, and a promotion to adjutant general. To put that in today's money, one ruble would have brought around $60 USD. There would be other favorites in Catherine's much later years, similarly compensated, but her immediate but his immediate successor was Potemkin. Gregory Potemkin was born into an impoverished noble family whose members had served with distinction both in the military and the diplomatic corps. He'd worked his way up from private to captain in the horse guards, and he was the one who gave her the ornamental tassel for her sword during the coup for which he had granted him 60,000 rubles. However, it was not until 12 years later that they became lovers and possibly even man and wife. Potenkin won her by playing hard to get. He fled from her attentions at one point, hiding out in a monastery, growing a beard and threatening to take holy orders, which would have put him out of her reach forever. He even stood her up here is an excerpt from one line letter from Catherine that is found among his events. I thank you for your visit. I don't understand what kept you. Can it be that my words gave you a reason not to come? I said that I wanted to go to sleep only so that everyone would leave and I could see you sooner. No sooner had I gone to bed than I got up, dressed and went to the entrance to the library to wait for you. I stood in a draft for two whole hours, and it was nearly 11 o'clock when I returned to bed, and thanks to you, spent a fifth sleepless night. Uh, the Empress of Russia stood two hours in a draft, and Potemkin stood her up. She called him her dog, her sweet, her love, her husband, I'm nauseous. There was some indication that Catherine and Potemkin were married, but the jury is still out. Potemkin got anything he wanted from her by ignoring her in public or sulking and absenting him from court. Catherine's acceptable acceptance of all this was totally pathetic, but not necessarily a bad thing because Potemkin, unlike Catherine's toy boys, was actually competent and good for Russia if not for her neighbors. He was always by Catherine's side or in communication from her father. She could discuss anything with him. He was advising as well as loving. She gave him a series of increasingly powerful positions, but the following is a list of his actual achievements. One, he made a secret alliance with Austria against the Ottomans in 1781. The Ottomans were taken by surprise when they declared war on Russia in 1787. As viceroy of Russia's southern provinces, that's Ava, Saratov, Sevastopol, I'm sorry, Astrakhan and the Caucasus, Potemkin founded Sevastopol and other cities and built an effective Black Sea naval fleet. Three, in 1783, he moved the Crimean Khanate from nominal independence although dominated by Russia, in fact, to actual Russian territory along with Kuban. He forcibly resettled the Zaporizhian Cossacks, who had been supportive of the Pugachev rebellion in Kuban. Now, I'm hoping that Zap will correct me on this, but didn't Stalin have to do the same thing? Um, granted the Kingdom of Georgia protection against Persia, when Potemkin could no longer respond to her sexual needs, he procured a Caesar series of favorites for her, each one increasingly her June. He was secure in the knowledge he had her heart and mind. He died five years before she did 
and please help save my voice and participate in the discussion break. So are you opening up for questions, Jane? Yes, I'm asking for a discussion before okay. I go completely forced. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm curious. So from what I'm understanding, is it possible that they never, cons Peter and Catherine never consummated their marriage? Is that what you might have been hinting at? No, no, Catherine definitely consummated. I mean, she was not about to get involved with anybody. She couldn't consummate unless they were really useful, like Hanbury Williams. Um, no, it's you see the actual marriage. There's no um, actual record of it. Um, no, no, I mean maybe, Peter, Peter and Catherine. Oh, Peter and Catherine. Yeah, they probably consummated it. I don't think they would have been allowed to not do that. But remember that early on, Peter had the phimosis. And so uh, while well, he could produce sperm, um, although even Baranceva is not recorded as giving birth to any of his children, um, he could permit, but it never kind of got out of the neighborhood. Okay. And then how many children altogether did Catherine have? Oh, Lord, please. <laughs> oh, we don't, okay, I we don't know that. I, I lost track and I wasn't sure if you knew. Um, but by a number of different um, mates, right? Uh, go ahead and give yours. No, no. I mean, but she had, obviously, she had a number of different um, uh, sexual liaisons. So she, her children were by a number of different partners, correct? Oh, yes. The Emperor Paul. She was very canny about that in her, in her memoirs. She claimed that the original... Um, Pregnancy ended in miscarriage, that would have been sold to Later on, she draws a veil over whether it was Peter or Soltikov. It could have been odd. She definitely gave um, birth to um, Poniatowski's child. Um, beyond that, I think there was one more, but I wouldn't swear to it. Okay. And then um, as far as Elizabeth was concerned, Peter's mother, Paul was the legitimate heir, right? Oh yeah, she was okay. Peter's daughter. And okay. she was the obvious person to be the, okay. the heir. All right, I just wanted to make sure I had that straight. I'm not sure if any, I haven't seen a lot of questions in the chat, but if people have them, maybe you could either type them in or if you wanna raise your hand and ask your question on your own, that would be great too. We can unmute you for that. Okay. Um, from what I go on right now, I, I will happily be interrupted. Okay. Um, so um, I don't see any, any questions, but let me just ask a question. So a uh, couple of things I have, I guess. The Paniatkovsky, uh, for instance, um, in the vision um, of Poland between Prussia, Austria, and um, Russia, why didn't she promote Panetkovsky as her lover as being the next Polish uh, duke, so to speak? And um, what, what, was, what was the reason that um, even though her, her lover, she decided to create a bloody, Catherine said, created a bloody you know, uh, war with the Suvorov at Helm and um, destroy, and I think it's even uh, Kostyushko, Kostyesko was part of that rebellion um, that was uh, badly suppressed by Russians. Yes, well, actually, um, I believe that Poniatowski was our king. Now, uh, Poland had a history of outsourcing kings, by the way. Um, for example, um, Catherine de' Medici sent them her son to be the king by their request. Uh, actually, um, Poniatowski was Catherine's choice because he remembered her nightgown and he was reliably her cat's paw. Um, he was of course not that popular in Poland for precisely that reason. And yes, the Kosciuszko did lead a rebellion. Um, and we will continue with the, um, I mean, the partition of Poland. I go over that because my next uh, section is um, Catherine as empress and her policies abroad and at home. I mean, we should do some history, right? Yes. Um, 
so I guess the, the next question is, um, uh, uh, Peter, I guess you're probably going to come to that. Peter's death, uh, was it such a, an accident or was it orchestrated by her? Did she ever mention anywhere, uh, obviously not in the memoirs, but, you know, as being the uh, plotter uh, in, in killing uh, Peter, who was her cousin, right, apparently, as well. Yeah, he was her cousin. Um, actually, after the coup, Peter went to this little palace at Raksha, uh, which, by the way, has never been preserved, although the Iranian bomb uh, is today still gorgeous. Um, the, uh, he went to Raksha, and there he was under the call, the guardianship of Alexei and his other brothers, not Gregory, I think. And it, there are three different uh, accounts of what happened to him at that point. He ended up dead. Of course, Catherine didn't want to be blamed for the, um, for the death. And I think she went through certain hoops in her, mem not in her memoirs, but in her letters to Poniatowski and other people. Uh, so as not to be blamed, it was an accident. They had a fist fight. Um, he had hemorrhoids. I love that one. <laughs> and, um, and he was drunk. He, he passed away by too much alcohol. I mean, it's, it's a case of take what you like and leave the rest. Okay, well, we can continue. And um, I will now continue with Catherine the Empress, and I will start with foreign policy. The end of the 18th century was a time of wildfire, wildfire. Revolutions in France, the America, wars among the powerful states of Austria, England, Russia, Sweden, Russia, and Ottoman Turkey, all ending in the devastating conflagration of the Napoleonic era that was to follow so very shortly and make all the rest seem like a picnic. Russia, with an eye always on territorial expansion, particularly at the expense of Turkey, but also in Europe, had to thread a whole pincushion full of diplomatic needles particularly those involving the rush, rivalry of Austria and Prussia. Between these two, you know, I've made this cool chart of Russia and her enemies and her friends. Unfortunately, as is my want, I was going to give green for um, friends and red for enemies. And I see that in this version, I actually have done this. Okay, um, so the green and red dotted lines, Prussia and Austria, Russia was constantly wavering between the two, the alliance. Russia was definitely not a fan of Sweden, not a fan of Turkey, and could most of the time count on England as an ally, but not always. Between Russia and Austria, since the days of Peter the Great, Russia's alien alliances wavered depending on the personal preference of the Russian emperor or regent, as well as the success or failures by diplomacy, intrigue, or sexual technique of the members, sorry, of the Russian imperial court. Then there was Poland. The king in Poland died on October of 1763. Poland's king was elected by the Diet of Poland. Catherine threw her support and Russia's behind Poniatowski, who became king. This was extremely useful to her because she was looking for a way to bring an end to the Seven Years' War, even though Russian troops were no longer involved. The war had started over Prussia's takeover of Silesia, a part of Poland that had been under Austrian domination. Everybody was weary of war by this time, especially Poland, which was torn apart by civil war beginning in 1768. And it was hoped that some kind of permanent peace could be achieved. Civil wars do not pay 
when hungry neighbors are next door salivating at the chance to loot a burning house. In 1770, the following plan for what is now called the first partition of Poland, but isn't that now called it, wasn't then called it because it wasn't the first, it was the partition of Poland and there were two more. Austria could have Silesia back, but since Prussia would have to be compensated, Prussia could have the bits of the Lutheran North that would give him a bridge between East and West Prussia and deprive Prussia of its ports. Russia would take the territory East of the Dnieper along with its Orthodox population. The excuse for this land grab was Russia's deep need to protect the religious freedom of the inhabitants who were said to be persecuted for their dissonant, that is Russian Orthodox faith. Poland might not like it, but the Polish king was easier to persuade he still remembered Catherine's gown. And here are the two following partitions of Poland, which you see getting smaller and smaller. Poland, has anybody seen Poland? Did I leave it under my counter, the kitchen counter? Russian soldiers pursued fleeing Polish troops into the Turkish border and massacred civilians in a Turkish town in September, 1768. In response, Turkey detained the Russian ambassador. His detention was the excuse Russia needed to invade full court press. Turkey was in no way prepared. There was no shortage of manpower but the Turkish government had been indolent in supporting its military. Corruption undermined arrangements to keep the troops supplied with food and material. Led by General Pyotr Rumyantsev, the hero of Kolberg, and governor of Little Russia, also known as the Ukraine, the Russians faced Turkish forces that vastly outnumbered them and easily won. Russia ended up in 1789 with a port on the Sea of Azov, with access to the Black Sea, direct enlargement of their southern territory at the expense of Turkey, and independence of the Crimea, an independence that didn't last all that long. Russia was also named protector of Orthodox Christians in Crimea, a status that would provide excuse for Russian military action there. And you can see absolutely nothing has changed, right? Over and over again. Catherine's second Turkish war continued the expansion this time into what is now Romania and the annexation of the Crimean Khanate. There were other wars somewhat less important. So continuing into domestic policy, the policy, the philosophy that informed Catherine's stated domestic policy ideals was that of the Enlightenment, which Catherine absorbed through published writings of and her private correspondence with Voltaire, D'Alembert, and Diderot. What informed her actual domestic policy was the situation on the ground. And here we go with our three giants of the Enlightenment. Diderot, D'Alembert, I'm sorry, Voltaire, of course, in the middle, and D'Alembert. Catherine's first attempt to communicate with Voltaire went through official channels and was declined by him. She wrote directly to him in 1765. He replied and the correspondence continued until his death in 1778. Voltaire, as I said, kept a picture of Catherine by his bed and it was the last thing he saw before he closed his eyes in his sleep each night. She had been an admirer of his work since her childhood. When Diderot was unable to make ends meet on the small pension given him by the French government, he advertised his library for sale. 
Catherine bought it with the stipulation that it would remain in his possession as long as he lived. D'Alembert, who was a mathematician as well as a philosopher, was made an honorary member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Before her coup, Catherine was well aware of the deficiencies in the Russian legal code, mostly that there wasn't one. Laws were made and enforced locally among diverse religious and ethnic groups. What existed on a countrywide level had been revised into uselessness. Many parts were now incomprehensible. One of her first official acts was to call a commission on the laws, modeled on the Etat General of France with delegates from all levels of society, except of course the serfs, to study the legal code and advise her on proposed revisions to it. She sat down in 1763 to write a framework for their deliberations and make clear the principles on which the new laws should be based. When finished in 1767, it was 64 pages long. Surprisingly, since he was a Turk on so many other levels, at least according to Catherine's memoirs, Peter III had been much of the same mind as Catherine's writings regarding religious tolerance, humane treatment of serfs and prisoners, among other issues. The difference is the actual past laws expressing this and she didn't. Among Peter's new laws was that if noblemen killed a serf, they could be tried for murder. This was resented by the nobility, of course, and it cost him. His proclamation of religious freedom, his sympathies were Lutheran, after all, horrified the church. He abolished the secret police and Catherine schemed in comfort for her coup. All this had lessons for Catherine and so her, infection, her instructions to the conference she called for revision of the laws did not quite jog with her professed faith in the rights of man. Here are some excerpts from her nakaz, the instructions. The extent of the dominion, which is Russia, requires an absolute power to be vested in the person who rules over. What is the true end of monarchy? Not to prescribe, deprive people of their natural liberty, but to correct their actions in order to attain the supreme good. The intention and the end of monarchy is the, not the end of the monarchy, but the end desire of monarchy is the glory, a sense of, is the glory of the citizens, the state and the sovereign. From this glory, a sense of liberty arises in the people governed by a monarch which may produce in these states as much energy and contribute as much to the happiness of the subject as liberty itself. Well, so far there's more of legalism than there is of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. We continue. There are means of preventing crimes and these are the punishments inflicted by the laws. Every punishment of which is not inflicted through necessity is tyrannical. She suggests that sacrilege should be expulsion by, from the churches or exclusion from the society of the faithful. Hello, excommunication and interdict. In chapter seven of the Nakaz, Catherine writes, corruption of the purity of morals, either public or private, should result in monetary penalties, shame or disguise Expulsion from the city park. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no gay pride flags, please, were Russian. Catherine recommends that capital punishment be restored as the remedy for having taken away or attempted to take away the life of another citizen. As for crimes against property, since they are often committed by poor people who can't make financial restitution, they must be subjected to corporal punishment. Thought Columbia. However, in chapter eight, we read, the greatest punishment for a bad action will be for the party to be convinced of it. And the cause of all licentiousness proceeds from the neglect of punishing 
crimes. In chapter nine, two witnesses are necessary to form a right judgment, good for her. Torture demands loudly the total abolition of it, good for her. She devotes several paragraphs to the use of torture and interrogations pointing to the permanent damage inflicted and the unreliability of information obtained. She states every person who's innocent, whose crime is not yet proved. Well, decisions in a court of justice must be finalized in a little time possible, just like ours, and punishment inflicted immediately. Despite what she says regarding capital punishments in chapter seven, she recommends it in a civil case when a citizen has such power by his connections as may enable him to raise disturbances dangerous to the public peace. No comment. She admonishes that any laws must be clearly stated. Okay, now, in the end, nothing was accomplished by the commission. Although the very first line of the Dukas declares Russia to be a European power, Catherine repeatedly invokes the specialness of Russia to justify her later repressive policies. The estates which excluded all but a few privileged serfs from recognition could not agree and argued endlessly and pointlessly. And maybe that was the point. Serfs, since the time of Peter the Great, serfs were bound to the land they worked for. The masters could sell their serfs, that's the owners of the land, as family units or as individuals and administer corporal punishment, sometimes fatal as well. In fact, there was no difference between American slaves and serfs other than the color of their skin. Catherine may have started with a benevolent attitude towards the serfs, but she had to deal with the nobility that owned them by the thousands, sometimes hundred thousands, and the nobility had been the core of supporters of her coup. In fact, serfdom increased under her reign, reaching at least 13 million by the time of her death in 1796, slightly over 30% of the total population of Russia. If Catherine had planned emancipation later on, the Pugachev rebellion changed her mind. A major contribution to that increase was Catherine's gifts to her noble supporters of large tracts of state land, including the peasants on them, who now became serfs. Now, let's get into Pugachev. The first troubles began in the mines of the Ural Mountains. No matter how bad conditions are for agricultural workers, mine work is worse. Explosions, methane gas, dynamite was yet to come, collapse, bad air, black lung disease, TB, and some mines, including those in Russia, radons off the charts. Since the workers were serfs, they were expendable, especially when they got old. This smoldering unrest spread far from Catherine, whose attention was on her Turkish campaigns. On the other side of the Volga River, the Don Cossacks, usually content with their de facto autonomy, were gathering in support of one Emelian Pugachev, or as Pugachev claimed he was, Peter III. There had been other pretenders, a famous one in the opera Boris Godunov, which is some amelioration of misery, but Pugachev issued a manifesto in 1773 promising to end taxation and kill all the notes. And I am supposed to be here on slide 42. And that shows Pugachev, or as he would call himself, Peter III out of the grave, um, dispensing um, justice to the nobles about to die and now on their knees. Abetted by Cossacks, the government forces who 
switch side during military confrontations and recruit from the old believers who wanted the church back the way it was. I said they were a pain. Gorbachev's forces grew and were soon joined by runaway serfs, discontented peasants, Tatars, and the original already rebellious miners from the Urals. Gorbachev's vow to exterminate the nobility resulted in multiple massacres. He carried it out of nobles and peasants who refused to accept him as their emperor. By 1774, Catherine finally took notice and warned Novgorod, just north of Kazan, that Novgorod, the episode of the rebellion to be on its guard. She sent General Vibikov to Orenburg to face Pugachev and his army of 15,000. Vibikov brought artillery, in the face of which Pugachev abandoned those of his troops that were had no horses and disappeared to a collective sigh of relief. Vivikov was feverish, laid aside his general staff, and died. Pugachev was to reappear months later at Kazan. The Russian army sent to pacify the area was too late to save the town. The city was burnt and the population massacred, but the Russians dispersed Pugachev's troops taking 5,000 prisoners and killing 2,000 of them. The prisoners in Pugachev's camp, 10,000 of them were freed. Pugachev's troops taking, Pugachev's resilience had been proven. Catherine took the matter seriously and sent Count Panin for mopping up. Remember him, he was the Paul's tutor. Panin, but he was up to the job. Panin was almost as brutal as Pugachev, and he wanted unlimited authority throughout the region. Fortunately, the re resolution of the Turkish war gave Catherine a little breathing room, and she backpedaled paddles Panin. She backpedaled Panin. She resisted when she saw it was an imminent usurpation on top of the rebellion. She was probably right. It was the right decision. Bogachev failed to gather recruits from the more prosperous parts of the emperor in which he found himself, and eventually his own men turned to men. Under questioning from which Catherine had ordered that torture be excluded, Bogachev confessed. He was sentenced to quartering and then beheaded, but Catherine feared a public demonstration, so he was beheaded in the prison behind closed doors. Education. Catherine set up a system of standardized free public education through high school for everyone of male gender and not serfs. Girls schools taught the wifely trades for the most part, but there was the free small knee institute for higher education of noble women and the Novo da Vichy Institute for female common. Catherine organized a central system of administration that's political administration over 50 provinces and 500 districts based on population. The system persisted for about 100 years. And I will have only one more topic of conversation and that is inoculation, that's short. More people died of smallpox in Russia in any given year than were killed in military action. And that was a lot. It had a 30 to 40% mortality. Affluence was no defense against infection. Peter III was a smallpox survivor. Peter II had died of the thing. And so was Queen Elizabeth of England. Children were particularly susceptible. In Russia, one out of every seven children died of smallpox on top of other causes of infant mortality. But the disease spared absolutely nobody. Those who survived were left with scars. Women particularly lost their hopes of marriage and family by the disfigurement. Generous cowpox vaccines began in the year of Catherine's death. Before that, there was a procedure known as variolation, which was used in Turkey and other countries. It involved pressing the pus from smallpox blister into a small wound on the arm of the recipient. Too much pus and the variolated person got smallpox and a 2.3% risk of death from the procedure. Too little and there was no protection. Catherine, overcoming her terror of it, 
had herself treated and popularized variolation throughout the empire. And we can give her a few free passes for that. That is it. So Jane, um, one point that somebody I think um, had a question on, you had said that uh, it was the same as American slavery, but um, is it possible that they were only saleable by lot when the land was sold as opposed to individual sale of individual serfs? Oh no, uh, serfs could be sold and they were sold. Um, I suspect uh, there was bidding on them. Uh, there was, I had at one point, I might even have it now, I'm not sure. Um, a picture, no, it's gone, I took it off. But there was, I did have a picture of a uh, surf auction, very quiet thing being held in somebody's essentially dwelling where a number of people were um, shown a uh, couple of female serfs and um, they were to bid on these. Uh, but the slave auctions off ships didn't happen because for the most part, the serfs belong to the land, which okay. wasn't the case with Africans. All right. And then also too, um, uh, I'm not sure because you didn't give the exact dates, but I know that during revolutionary um, America, um, that same type of, of vaccination um, for smallpox was going on. I know uh, Washington ordered it for the troops and um, I know, uh, what's her name? Adams, um, John Adams' wife um, had her family uh, while he was away. They, they were all inoculated. What was the type of, the name of the procedure that you said? It's called variolation. Variolation, and okay. It, yeah. it, it's putting the pus from live smallpox, I, um, a live smallpox lesion in someone into somebody else. Okay, so what would have been the what would it have been the date that or roughly the date that she was doing that? Uh, I'm not quite sure when she started it. Uh, at some point towards the end of her uh, rule, she did. Okay, yeah, because I yeah, like I said, that's exactly what they were doing in the United States. Well, yeah, what was about to become the United States, but during the Revolution. Uh, because there were, was a lot of smallpox among the uh, revolutionary troops and also among the colonists. There was a lot of smallpox all through the world until Jenna. Okay, thank you. And we have people thanking you for this presentation. So what was her actual date of death, the end of her reign? Oh, I have to look. I'm terrible on dates. I think it was 1796, but I'm not sure. So that probably would have been the approximate dates that she, yeah. So it would have been contemporary with the with uh, the American variolation procedures, I think. And by the way, um, her son, Paul, who hated her so much, uh, he was assassinated five years after he became the emperor. Nobody liked him. Okay. Now, was that hate instilled? That is there any indication that it was Elizabeth that instilled that hate for his mother? Uh, no. Um, Paul identified with his father, okay. and so uh, she had, according to Paul, she had killed his father. It's a good enough reason, I guess. Yep. <laughs> Fat fratricide. I mean, uh, patricide. Yes. Okay. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. But there's a lot of people thanking you for your time and talent. Thank you. Okay, well, I will depart then. Thank you very much. Uh, just to be sure, does anyone else have any questions at all? If you wanna put them in the chat, or I guess you can raise your hand, but um, I don't know, I don't see a lot. Okay. Well, I'm going to go drink something soothing. <laughs>
Thank you. 